All right, now we're talking about for chapter 13 of anatomy physiology, protection and support of the brain with the brain and cranial nerves. Uh, we should now, after this session, be able to compare and contrast the structure and locations of three meninges and identify the spaces between the meninges. Describe the four cranial dural septa and give their locations. Describe the anatomy and location of the ventricles and explain the three functions of cerebral spinal fluid. As well as be able to trace the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid, beginning with its origin and ending with its removal. And describe the components that form the blood brain barrier and explain how the blood brain barrier protects the brain. So, the cranial meninges, there are three consecutive, uh, con I'm sorry, three connective tissue layers. Uh, they separate and support the soft tissue of the brain. Uh, they enclose and protect the blood vessels supplying the brain. They help contain and circulate cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, they go from deep superficial, the uh, PM mater, a delicate mother, essentially, or arachnoid mater, which is a spider mother. So, you can imagine spider webs type uh, basically going outward. And the dura mater, tough mother, being tough, right, which makes sense, the most superficial type layer being tougher and more spider-like projection, so to speak, with the arachnoid mother more uh, mid-layer, so to speak, and the deepest layer being more delicate, which would make the most sense being innermost. Uh, so with the pia mater, it's the innermost of the meninges, it adheres to the brain's surface. It's a thin layer of areolar connective tissue. Uh, the arachnoid mater uh, lies external to the pia mater, uh, and the arachnoid trabeculae extend the pia mater through subarachnoid space, and the subarachnoid space contains the cerebrospinal fluid. So that's important to note, the subarachnoid space of the arachnoid within the arachnoid mater contains the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and the arachnoid mater is made of a web of collagen, you know, the more strength uh, type uh, aspect to connective tissue to give you more strength to the fibers, and the elastic, the more give for the fibers. It lies deep to the dura mater. It subdur the subdural space is a potential space that can fill with blood if a vein is ruptured. Uh, the dura mater is tough outer membrane made of dense irregular connective tissue in two layers, the meningeal layer, the deeper layer of the dura, and the periosteal layer, the more superficial layer of the dura. It forms a periosteum on the internal surface of the cranial bones. Uh, and the layers of the dura mater are usually fused but in some areas, they separate to form dural venous sinuses that drain blood from the brain. Has to be able to do that too. The epidural space is a potential space between the dura and the skull, and it contains the arteries and the veins. So here we have our image. Seeing first, showing what, we're, what space we're looking at here. So here we have our arachnoid villus, and the dural, basically the dural venous sinus, the superior sagittal sinus, which is here. We have the falx cerebi, here, a little space kind of separating your light and right, left and right hemispheres here. Uh, our skin of our scalp, then we have the periosteum, and we have the bone of the skull, okay? And we have a periosteal layer, and we have a meningeal layer, which is called the dura mater right there. And the subdural space, that's basically that potential space in between there, between the meningeal and the arachnoid, meningeal layer of the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. And the subarachnoid space is a, a space, of course, in between all the uh, basically, arachnoid mater uh, projection, so to speak, there. Arachnoid trabeculae. And then the pia mater here. And the cerebral cortex. And the white matter. And you can bet, you'll probably see a picture like that for uh, oh, your exam. Be able to break that down. Uh, so, from clinical view standpoint, again, stuff is kind of good to know for, well, it's definitely good to know long term, but for the mount, short term, you'll not be tested on it, but it's important to be able to make applications uh, down the road, and you will at some point. Uh, the epidermal hematoma is a pool of blood in the epidural space of the brain. It's usually due to severe blow to the head. And so, the adjacent brain tissue is distorted and it's compressed, can lead to severe neurological injury or death unless bleeding is stopped and blood is removed. Subdural hematoma is a hemorrhage in the subdural space. It's typically from ruptured veins and from a fast rotational head movement. Uh, it would take a lot. Okay? Uh, compression of the brain tissue occurs with, and more, occurs more slowly than epidural, epidural hematoma. Likewise, um, important for down the road, meningitis and encephalitis. Uh, meningitis is inflammation of meninges. It's typically caused by viral or bacterial infections. Symptoms are fever, headache, vomiting, stiff neck. Pain from meninges sometimes referred to as posterior neck. That may result in brain damage and death if it's untreated. And it can, and bacterial meningitis is, is, uh, has more severe symptoms. Uh, encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. It's most often from viral infections. Symptoms are drowsiness, fever, headache, neck pain. It may also uh, result in death. So cranial meninges, meninges, we have our cranial dura septa, which are the sheets of the dura mater that extend into the cranial cavity. They form partitions through the brain areas. They provide support. 
like the Falk Cerebri, Cerebri, which we looked at briefly, uh, the largest of the dural septa. It's located on the midline. It projects into a longitudinal fissure between the cerebral hemispheres, left and right hemispheres. It contains the superior sagittal sinus and the inferior sagittal sinus. The tentorum cerebelli, or the tent of the cerebellum, we're not going to go into detail with for the anatomy at this time, uh, more so perhaps in a later unit when we have the opportunity to do so. Uh, for the cranial dural septa, though, we do want to make sure we understand the Falk cerebelli uh, basically runs vertically in the mid-sagittal plane. Uh, it separates the left and right cerebral cerebellar uh, hemispheres and contains occipital sinus and its posterior border. And likewise, I'm not going to worry about for the short term, the diaphragm of cellae or celli, not for now, for not now, for now anyway. So for the cranial dural septa, having a look here for our mid-sagittal section and the posterior view then over here, uh, you can see here, here, of course, we have our cranium. Then we have the dura mater, okay? the falx cerebri, cerebri, and you can see a little more clear what we're talking about here and look at more of the posterior view. We'll kind of go back and forth here. Dura mater there, we're just seeing the dura mater there. And the superior sagittal sinus here, which would be more right down the middle down here. The inferior sagittal sinus, a little blue line right there. Uh, I'm not going to be able to see here in this posterior view. Diaphragm cellae, which would be here technically. Uh, pituitary gland being a big player obviously for us here uh, the straight sinus uh, the tentorium uh, cerebelli here or cerebelli if you will showing it more right in here our tentorial notch here uh, the transverse sinus there our confluence of sinuses come together there and of course here from more posterior better view posteriorly our Falk cerebelli right here. You can see the same there. And then our occipital sinus is the sinus, the cerebral edge being clear, it's there. Uh, and of course, our brain stem, the posterior view, as well as from our mid sagittal section. So our ventricles of our brain are cavities within the brain. Uh, they are lined with ebendymal cells. We talked about that, remember, with the central nervous system for the glial type cells we find there. Uh, it gives support, right? Uh, and they contain cerebral spinal fluid uh, that connect with each other and with the spinal cord central canal. Uh, our four ventricles in our brain, we have our two lateral ventricles. There are large cavities in the cerebrum. They're separated by a medial partition, the septum pellus pellucidum. The third ventricle is a narrow space in the middle of the day encephalon. It connect, it's connected to each lateral ventricle by an interventricular uh, foramen. The fourth ventricle is a sickle shaped space between the pons and the cerebellum. It's connected to the third ventricle by the cerebral aqueduct. It opens to a subarachnoid space medially and laterally, and it narrows before merging with the central canal of the spinal cord. So here we can take a look at the ventricles of the brain. So here we have first to the posterior side, we have our third ventricle here. We have our inter interventricular foramen there. We have our lateral ventricles here. Our cerebral aqueduct, our fourth ventricle, our lateral aperture, and our median aperture. All looking at our lateral view there. And of course, this being the anterior, more from the, from the front here of view here, our cerebellum, our cerebellum, excuse me, cerebrum, excuse me, and the lateral ventricle. Uh, we have our interventricular foramen, our third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, uh, and our fourth ventricle all throughout this space here. And of course, our central spinal, central canal of our spinal cord. Now, cerebral spinal fluid. It's a clear colorless liquid that surrounds our central nervous system. It circulates in the ventricles and subarachnoid space. Its functions are to provide buoyancy, reduce the brain's apparent weight by 95%. Uh, it's also forming protection, providing a liquid cushion, and environmental stability, the transport of nutrients, wastes, and protects against fluctuations. Uh, as far as the cerebrospinal fl fluid formation, it's formed by the choroid plexus in each ventricle. There's a layer of epidymal cells that in blood capillaries within the pia, and the blood plasma is filtered through cap the capillaries and uh, modified by epidymal cells. And the, compared to the plasma, central, surface, central cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid has more sodium chloride and less potassium and calcium and glucose. Uh, in addition, the epidymal cell secretions and interstitial fluid from subarachnoid, subarachnoid space help make up the cerebral spinal fluid. And that cerebral spinal fluid is continually formed and reabsorbed. Uh, excess such cerebrospinal fluid flows into the arachnoid villi and drains into the dural venous sinuses. Uh, and arachnoid granulation is a collection of these villi. So here we can see the choroid plexus. See what area we're looking at with a cut here. 
uh, basically, and then basically look at right here centrally. We have our longitudinal fissure, fissure here, the choroid plexus, on either side there of lateral in the lateral ventricles, and the corpus callosum. Our white matter versus our gray matter. Once again, here the coronal section uh, of the, or close-up section that, or funnel type cut, funnel plane type cut. Then we have our ependymal cells here, uh, the capillaries, and there's this our section of our choroid plexus here, the pia mater, that little white going around the outside here, or right in this layer, I should say here. And then we have the central cerebral spinal fluid formed from our blood plasma and the ependymal cells and enters the ventricle via the capillaries. And that's, of course, the cavity of the ventricle we're looking at here. And then production and circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. You see that general flow uh, beginning the choroid plexus of the third ventricle area here. Uh, basically, we're looking at here uh, off the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle and then it's going to flow here through our canal in our cerebral aqueduct and you got basically a lateral aperture here and the choroid plexus the fourth ventricle coming by here and the meet to the median aperture that's going to flow out through that cerebroarachnoid space uh, and basically it's going to create that venous flow along that cerebroarachnoid space uh, and then by and going along the rectoid villi here uh, and then circulates around that entire space around And then uh, from a standpoint of the circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid here, we have our dual ve dural venous sinus, sinus here, superior sagittal sinus. Here's our arachnoid villus, that space, that whole guy here. And the cerebral spinal fluid flow and flowing out that way. Uh, this being referring to the dura mater, or the periosteal layer. And arachnoid mater, again, those web light projections here, subarachnoid space between. Uh, and then the pia mater here, that's cerebral cortex. Uh, from Another clinical type view briefly here, hydrocephalus uh, basically is a pathologic condition of excessive cerebral spinal fluid. It often leads to brain distortion. It can result from obstruction in the central cerebral spinal fluid, uh, restricting reabsorption. It can result from intrinsic problem with arachnoid villi. Uh, in a young child, the head's enlarged with possible neurological damage. It can be treated surgically, uh, an implant that shuts the, and shunts and drains uh, the cerebral spinal fluid to other body regions. Now the blood-brain barrier, which as we know helps being for, has a uh, formed uh, with primarily the assistance of the glial cells, the astrocytes, and the cerebral and the central nervous system. Uh, in this case, the functions of the blood-brain barrier regulates which substances enter the brain's interstitial fluid. It helps prevent neuron exposure to harmful substances, uh, drugs, waste, abnormal solute concentrations. Now some drugs can pass and affect the brain, like alcohol can pass that blood-brain barrier. Uh, that blood-brain barrier is composed of specialized capillaries. The endothelial cells are connected by many tight junctions. The walls have a thick basement membrane that wrap by paravascular feet, which are the astrocyte extensions. And the blood-brain barrier is reduced in certain locations for functional reasons. Uh, the choroid plexus needs to produce the cerebral spinal fluid, and the hypothalamus and pineal glands need to secrete hormones. So we have an image of our blood-brain barrier here. Being our astrocyte here uh, around that capillary, uh, it's giving support to the capillary here and the erythrocyte inside the ca capillary and the red blood cell, right? Uh, oxygenated cell. Uh, and then we have a continuous basement membrane here, this layer outside there. There's a tight junction uh, between the endothelial cells and there's a nucleus for endothelial cell. And then from the capillary, we have our basement membrane here. We have endothelial cells here and here. These guys, all these all along here, right? And the perivascular feet of the astrocytes are all the, along the way along this capillary as well here. Uh, the lipid-soluble substances that freely pass through the blood-brain barrier, lipids here, go in those little white spaces there, glucose here. Astrocytes selectively allow certain substances to cross the blood-brain barrier, and of course this being erythrocyte over red blood cells. So what did you learn? Um, from the deepest or closest to the brain to the superficial, the farthest from the brain, name the meninges and the spaces between the meninges. meninges. Where's the falx cerebri uh, located and what is its role? Where's the fourth ventricle located? And how does it connect with the subarachnoid space? What are the three main functions of a cerebral spinal fluid? Where is cerebral spinal fluid first produced? Where does it circulate and how does it get removed? And how does the blood-brain barrier protect nervous tissue? And I'll come back for the cerebrum in section three of chapter 13 in just a moment.